Well, today we're going to dive into one of the Old Testament books, one that uh, doesn't always get the right focus, one that gets a little bit lost in the details, distracted. Well, we're going to get into it. We're actually going to go through the whole thing. It's short, but I started off and I thought, I'll just do a section of it, but it's just such a good story, I thought we need to finish it. So we'll go through the whole thing. We need to get back really to the true meaning behind this book. Because when I say the book of Jonah to people, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Right, the fish or the whale. We'll talk about that later. We will get to it. I'm just not going to, I'm not just going to ignore it, but it's, it's one of those things that get distracted. It's a Sunday school, it's a Sunday school lesson that quite often people don't revisit after Sunday school. So we're going to do that today. So who was Jonah? Jonah was a minor prophet. That doesn't mean that he was lesser than a major prophet. It doesn't mean that he was a non-prophet. <laughs> it means that he was a minor prophet, a little less wordy than the major prophet, so the books were shorter, but it doesn't mean they were less impactful. Jonah was a short book, but you can't judge it by its length. It doesn't take a lot of space in Scripture to create a powerful and impactful message. And Jonah certainly falls into that category. So let's begin reading the book of Jonah. It's kind of a tough one to find. It's embedded in all those small books of the minor prophets at the end of the Old Testament. So if you're in Micah, you've gone too far. If you're in Obadiah, you're not far enough. If you can find those ones too. But Jonah, the story of Jonah is set around the time of King Jeroboam II of Israel. And this was about 790 to 750 BC. So this is between seven, eight hundred years before Jesus came onto the, into the picture. How do we know this? Because, well, there's no guesswork. In 2 Kings 14, it says, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria, and he reigned for 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who he caused, all the Isra- he caused Israel to commit. He was one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebohamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord and the God of Israel spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet of gath Hepher. So there's a quick picture here. So it says Jonah right here, 2 Kings, around around that same time period. So a quick picture of how things were going in Israel at that particular time when Jeroboam was king, Jeroboam II. The outer limits, the border of Israel, had been restored to what God had originally intended them to be. And this was an unprecedented time of prosperity for Israel. Wine, olive oil, and probably horses were providing very profitable trading opportunities between Egypt and between Assyria. And that was helping the estimated 350,000 Israelites that were in the borders of Israel at that time. So things were going well in Israel at least for a minute, because you know things change dramatically in Israel from one decade to the next. So back to Jonah, let's start reading chapter 1, verse 1, and it said, the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come before me. So we get into the story here, and God is immediately telling Jonah to go to Nineveh. Why? Because it's, Nineveh is a place that's on God's radar. It's a place that needs some serious attention. This is a very unusual request of prophets. Normally they were asked to go into areas that were within Israel. But he's asking this prophet to go overseas. Doesn't really happen. So Jonah took that in. He thought about Nineveh. Nahum 3.1 provides, uh, provides a description of Nineveh. It says, Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. Jonah's thinking about this. This was kind of sin city in a bully nation or in a very aggressive nation at the time, and that was part of Assyria. If you wanted to put Nineveh on the map right now, you'd look it up and you'd find it in the middle of Iraq. And it would be kind of this, and half of the city of Mosul. We're familiar with the city of Mosul because we've seen it on TV. Some of you perhaps have even been there during the Iraq war. Definitely not a tourist site right now, but it wasn't back then either. But back in that time period, it was a huge city. In fact, for 50 years, roughly in that time period, it was one of the biggest cities, well, it was the biggest city in the world, with 120,000 people. So Jonah gets this instruction that he needs to go to Nineveh, a place that really doesn't have a great reputation. And what you expect should happen, well, in most of the stories of prophets, God tells them to go somewhere, and the next verse it says, and they left, and they went to wherever it was. Well, what did Jonah do? Verse 3, but Jonah ran away from the Lord. And he headed for Tarshish. 
He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port, and after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now, as I mentioned, Assyria was kind of the aggressive nation of the time, so what God had essentially done is he told Jonah, you need to go into enemy territory. But Jonah had other ideas, in fact, the exact opposite ideas. He went off in the other direction completely. If we put this into like, local context, let's say I'm here, well, I am here in Clovis, so we don't need to say it, but let's say God speaks to me now and says, you need to go to Phoenix, Arizona. And Phoenix, Arizona, I don't, I've never been there, but I assume the people are nice there, but let's just assume that there was a terrible place, Phoenix, Arizona, that was very aggressive, full of people, a sin city, not a place I really want to go. So I say to God, okay, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go the other direction. I go 2,000 miles. So Phoenix is about 500 miles. That's about the equivalent of, of where Jonah was to Nineveh. But I say, no, I'm going to go to Prince William Sound up in Alaska. It's about 2,000 miles in the other direction. That's about the equivalent of going to Tarshish. So what do I do? I, get on a, I go travel to Monterey. That's my jopper. I go to Monterey, get on a boat, and head up to Alaska. That's, that's, my, that's my solution to being asked to go to Phoenix. But the crazy part about this is that I think me going to Alaska is going to help me get away from God. I'm going to be able to hide from God over there. I mean, I know people do that. They go to Alaska to get away from things, but not God. Alaska is not beyond the reaches of God, just as Tarshish was not beyond the reaches of God. If you know European geography, then the equivalent is that Jonah was going to go to the coast of Israel. He was going to travel all the way across the Mediterranean Sea to Spain. That's where Tarshish was, on the Mediterranean coast of Spain. So that's 2,000 miles all the way across the Mediterranean. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to risk his life. He, but God had other plans, and God then started to direct the action. This is where God intervenes and says, okay, you're running the other way. This is what I'm going to do. And in verse 4, it picks up and says, The Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and a violent storm arose, and the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up. Call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so we won't perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots and find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? What people are you? He answered, I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God in heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew already that he was running away from the Lord because he'd already told them. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what shall we do to make the sea calm for us? He said, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that the great storm has come upon you. So here, God is putting on the brakes. Jonah's running. He put on the brakes. He's making this trip very dangerous, not just for Jonah, but all the sailors that are attached to him as well. And the sailors are panicking in the storm, and they're asking Jonah to pray to his God, just on the off chance that it would help them not die in this terrible storm. So here's some good information about these sailors that we should pick up on pretty quickly, is that they said pray to his God. These are not God-fearing people. These are not people that worship God. These are not followers of God. They pray to their own gods. Nothing changed. It's kind of like finding yourself in the middle of a fight and you're trying to be the peacekeeper and you're trying to pull people apart and you're getting pummeled in the process and you're like, hey, this is not my fight. But you're getting, you're getting pummeled in the process and it's just not fair. Here are the sailors on a ship in the middle of a storm that they know is not their fault. They know it's, they, they know it's supernatural, this storm. These are sailors. They understand storms. But this one, they just know that something else is wrong with this. So they're praying to God because they realize that something is, something's afoot with this storm. It's different. Why are they in this predicament? They're trying to figure this out. Now, Jonah knows. He just says, throw me overboard. I'm the issue. If you get rid of the issue, everything will be fine. But here's something else that says volumes about these sailors, because then it picks up in verse 13 and says, Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew wilder than before. So they didn't just throw him overboard. They thought, let's row back to the land. Give him a better chance of surviving. I'm sure they were trying to row back to the land for their own purposes too. But then they cried out to the Lord. They cried out to the Lord. Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard into the raging sea, and the raging sea grew calm. 
At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered the sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. So they're actually trying not to set him off adrift. They wanted to try and help him, take him to a shore where he had a better chance of survival. But in the process, they became God-fearing men. They cried out to the Lord. They made vows to God, and they wanted to make an offering to him. And when the calm came, that was what they, they understood. The important points that come out of this section is first... That sometimes people who don't follow God have more integrity than people that do. In modern Christian terms, we could say sometimes non-Christians act with more integrity and more honor than Christians do. And I understand, as Christians, we don't have a monopoly on integrity and honor. And non-Christians should act with integrity and honor, but it's, it's bad when Christians start acting lesser than that. When we who claim to be Christians that follow Jesus Christ, to the example that he provides, we we act with less integrity than those people that don't. They're just doing the right thing. We have more incentive to do the right thing. So when we act with less integrity, there's an issue. Here the sailors aren't selfish. They're not just trying to save themselves. They're trying to save Jonah as well. And they haven't even known him that long. But the beautiful thing about this is that God does not waste opportunities. He could have derailed Jonah's journey when he left to go to Joppa. In that time period, he could have privately dealt with with Jonah and derailed his trip and redirected him at that point. But he didn't do that. He decided to wait till he got on a ship and then provide a storm when other people were in jeopardy as well. Other people could see it. So here this huge storm was there. Immediately God calms it once Jonah is overboard. And this is a picture of power. Power over the forces of nature. It's not the first time that we see that. Parting of the Red Sea, power over the forces of nature. And we'll see it again in the New Testament and other parts of the Old Testament. But it's a picture of power. And he demonstrated this power to a group of men who didn't know him, that didn't follow him, didn't worship him. And they found a good reason suddenly to follow him, to pray to him. They witnessed something spectacular. And it led them to pray out to him, to cry out to him, to offer vows and an offering. Something that they would never have done before because it was Jonah's God. God provides for us spectacular things in our lives and they happen around us all the time. We just don't see them. He provides opportunities to see him through these events. But sometimes we're just not looking at them as God. Sometimes we see ourselves in these things. Our skills, our intelligence, our abilities. It's us. We are great. Sometimes we see it through the lens and abilities and skills of other people. And we say, they are so good. But sometimes it's God providing for us an opportunity to see him through the things that happen in our lives and in the lives of other people. Sometimes they're small things, sometimes they're not. And we miss it. Why? Because we're not looking. God provides opportunities. He doesn't waste any opportunities, but sometimes we don't engage with those opportunities to see him in our lives. So now with Jonah in the water, what does God do next? What is God's plan after Jonah was thrown into the water, the the storm is calmed, and in verse 17 it says, Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of a fish three days and three nights. That's the end of chapter 1. That's what you call a cliffhanger. (laughs) You get through all this storm, you get to the end, and Jonah's in the water, and God provides a fish, and he ends up three days in a fish. You don't stop reading at that point. You're like, what? (laughs) So, was it a whale or was it a fish? It says fish in that. Other versions it says, it uses words in the Greek that could be associated with whales. There's been a lot of speculation. We're not going to come up with the answer today. And the discussion about this is huge. And now, in modern terms, people are starting to move towards whale because the physiologically speaking there seems to be more opportunity for a whale to swallow a person or an animal and it survived for a period of time not three days there's been stories about animals and people that have been swallowed by whales and survived but not necessarily for three days does it matter not really so we're not going to get hung up on it but anyway people often have an issue with this part of the story and this is where the distraction comes in and at the end of chapter one everyone goes what that's silly get swallowed by a fish for three days. And they might stop reading at that point. 
But then to those people, you can say, well, just think about this for a second. Think about the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are three men that got thrown into an intense furnace, so intense that the people that were throwing them in got burnt. And they were in there for a period of time, walking around, didn't get burnt, none of their clothing even got burnt. So you say to them, what do you think of that story? Does that sound silly to you? Well, no, that's the power of God. This is the power of God. Why do we think that there's any, his power has any limitations because it involves an animal and it involves the sea? It's no different. This is the power of God. So we can't get hung up on this. It's not really the point of the story anyway. It's really just a tool that God uses in the life of Jonah to get things back on track. So we shouldn't let us distract from the story. Chapter 2, verse 1, coming off this cliffhanger of an ending, it says, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Now, in Sunday school, you see a lot of pictures of Jonah sitting at a desk with a light, the pictures on the wall, inside the whale or the fish. <laughs> it's a pretty picture. I'm sure it was nothing like that. Anyway, he does pray, and he says, and I'm going to go through the prayer. It's kind of long, but it's important because we're going to talk through this. It says, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me from the realm of the deep of the dead. I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths and to the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, seaweed was wrapped around my head, the roots of the mountains I sank down to the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought me my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, your whole, to your holy temple. Those who cling to the worthless idols turn away from God's love for them, but I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I will say salvation comes to the Lord. So this is the key. Jonah is inside the fish and he prays to God. But what does he pray? He prayed about the fact that he was crying out to God in this time of distress, describing the feelings that he had when he was in the water, where he was sinking down, getting dragged further and further down. And it says, from the deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. Now, here's another part of of the book of Jonah where there's a lot of disagreement between scholars. And you can listen to some of the top scholars, the top preachers, talk about this particular point, and they cannot agree on it. And that is the question, did Jonah die in the fish? Just the first part of his prayer, from deep in the realm of the dead. Other versions say Sheol, which is the place of the dead. So he said, from deep in the realm. He was in the place of the dead, according to him. So there's an argument that Jonah died when he went in the fish. Verse 6 says, To the roots of the mountain I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. Barred me in forever. But you, Lord, brought my life up from the pit. The amplified version of the Bible, after the word pit, has parentheses that says death. You, Lord, brought my life up from death. So many people think that he died and was brought back to life. Others think he was just on the brink of death, slipping into death. It seemed like he was about to be forever gone on this earth when God pulled him out of that, a kind of near-death experience. Whatever the answer, at some point he was able and conscious enough to pray inside the fish. And it says at the start of chapter 2, right at the start, it says, He answered me. So when we call out to God, there's a few things that happen when we call out to God. The first one is that when we call out to God, God answers our cries of distress even when we're guilty. Jonah was guilty. He was on his way to Tarshish. He wasn't on his way to Nineveh. He hadn't changed his mind and now he's on his way to Nineveh. And So when he called out to God, God's like, well, okay, you did change your mind. No, he was on his way to Tarshish. He was not changing his mind at that point. He was guilty of disobedience from running from God, and now he was in the water. Some of us get in trouble precisely because of our disobedience. And if we wonder at that point, is there hope? Will God have mercy on me? Will God hear me when I cry? Because I've been going in the wrong direction. Now I'm in trouble. If I cry to God, is he going to hear me? Then we can take heart from this story of Jonah. His distress was the fruit of his guilt, but God answered him and gave him another chance. Psalm 107 says a similar thing. 
says some sat in darkness, out of darkness, prisoners suffering in iron chains because they rebelled against God's commands and despised his plans, the plans of the Most High. So they, again, disobeyed God. They went in the wrong direction. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled, and there there was no one to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness, the utter darkness, and broke away their chains. And then later it says, he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. That's just an illustration of how far God will go to take us out of our distress when we ask him. So the second thing is, when we ask for God in our distress, or when we, we plead to God in our distress, God answers us in spite of his judgment. According to 115, the ship's crew were the ones that picked him up and threw him overboard. It wasn't God. But he knows it was God. It was because of God that that happened. They had no choice. They had to do that if they were going to live. God was frustrated at Jonah's disobedience. He knew that Jonah needed some kind of redirection. And I suppose if I was Jonah, and I knew in my despair that God was frustrated with me, I would, I would feel hopeless. It would feel hopeless. God himself is upset with me. It would feel hopeless. And there'd be a tendency to think, well, God put me in this situation... So I I don't think I can pray to him because he wants me here, otherwise he wouldn't have put me here. But despite that thought process, Jonah decided to pray for deliverance anyway. And God, the God who threw him in, heard his prayer and performed a miracle to save him. Even when God is frustrated with us, even when we're not doing the right thing that God wants us to do, he never brings us into tough times as a way of punishment. It's a way of redemption. There is always redemption out of these situations. There is a way to be redeemed. You just have to plead with God, ask for help, reach out to him. Also, if we plead with God, God answers us and delivers us from impossible circumstances. If we ask him, he will deliver us from impossible circumstances if we plead with him and it's the right thing for God to want to do. Verses 5 and 6 describe the extremity of Jonah's plight. So we're back in, verse, in chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me forever, but you, Lord, brought me up from the pit. It'd be a terrible thing to fall overboard, even in calm waters, and get left behind. But then you add to that a storm, 20 to 30 foot waves, and you're sinking and... To add to that, you get wrapped up in seaweed around your head and your arms. It feels like chains when you're underwater. You can't swim anymore. You can't get up, and you're sinking further and further down. It's a terrifying scene. But God let circumstances become impossible for Jonah before he stepped in. And often circumstances in our lives can seem to a point where there's just no way out. There's no hope. That there's nothing that we can do that's going to change it. It seems impossible but as it says in, in Mark 20, 10, 27, Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And when we cry out to God in our distress, he answers us and delivers us from impossible situations. Sometimes we rationalize these impossible situations. Say, well, you know, that this changed or that changed. Sometimes it's just God pulling us out of impossible situations. The fourth thing when, he, when we cry out to God is he answers us just in the nick of time. Verse 7 says, When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. In a more obvious way, we were saying, I was losing consciousness, and I remembered you, Lord. I needed to pray to you. Jonah was still praying when there was no answer in sight, just before he blacked out. God often answers prayer at the 11th hour. Many a Christian has used the example of Habakkuk, Habakkuk 1-2, where it says, How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? How long must I do that? That's Habakkuk saying that. But Jonah gives us the courage to be in unrelenting prayer, continuous prayer all the time, to keep on crying out to God, as we, even as we go unconscious and believe that God will answer us in the nick of time. But we have to remember that, yes, when God answers us, maybe in the nick of time... The fifth thing is when we cry out to God in our distress, God answers our cries, sometimes in stages. And sometimes those stages are not as comfortable. Sometimes they're not exactly what we wanted. So we have to get out of, this, out of our head this notion of all or nothing answers to prayer. We can be fairly sure that if 
that when Jonah cried out to God, he didn't say, oh God, please put me in the belly of a fish for three days. That would be a step. He wouldn't ask for that. He'd he'd probably say, get me to shore, get me out of this storm, get me out of the water, I don't want to be here. So sometimes God's answer comes in stages. The belly of a fish hardly seemed like salvation, but it was. Jonah was granted enough consciousness to realize that he'd been spared from drowning and that there was hope and things were moving in the right direction. So he doesn't complain about his surroundings. He accepts God's first stage of salvation and the guarantee of dry land coming up. And he concludes his prayer from the fish's belly with the great affirmation, salvation comes from the Lord. That's when we praise God in the end. We get salvation even if it's one stage at a time. We praise God. We thank him. That's an important part of it. We can't disregard partial works of God. If he chooses to save us or heal us in stages, then we, he has a good purpose for that. And we ought to be grateful for any improvement in our condition that he happens to grant us. A fish's belly is better than the weeds at the bottom of the sea. Even if it's not the shores of Palestine yet, God answers us in stages and not all of them are comfortable. So we get to the end of chapter 2, and this culminates in, you know, and the Lord God commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. The next stage of salvation. And then the next section, after being spat up onto the shore, it says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Finally, he gets it. Now he obeys the word of the Lord. The Lord says to him again, I need you to go to Nineveh, and he's like, okay, I'm going. (laughs) He pretty much resigned himself to the fact that this was not going to end until he did what he was supposed to do. So now the chase is over. Jonah is heading in the right direction. Think about a modern day analogy of a chase. Let's just say I went to the mall and I decided to steal something, which I wouldn't do, but I'm just saying, imagine that. Hard to imagine. I'm in the store, I run out of the store, and I'm running through the mall. The mall cop sees me and he starts to chase after me. Now it's summer, so I'm wearing flip-flops. Can't get away from the mall cop, he's catching up with me. So I kick off my flip-flops, because I want to go faster. So I'm running faster now. Suddenly I go out of the door into the parking lot. It's summer. (laughs) I end up in the middle of the asphalt in the parking lot, and my feet are burning to the point where I can't run anymore. Mall cop catches up, arrests me, it's done. The chase is over. Sometimes running from God can be a bit like that. It's disobedience, because I'm stealing, I shouldn't be doing that. It's disobedient of me to steal. But then I run away. And I run away, and it seems like things are going okay for a while, and then it's not going okay. And I'm getting myself into worse and worse situations until finally the the pursuit is over. The chase is over. Why? Because I'm getting myself into worse circumstances when I'm doing it. And God pursues us the whole time. This song that we sang today, Reckless Love, I was actually going to request it, but it was kind of late in the game, so I thought it's a bit late to start requesting songs. Then I looked on the bulletin that evening, and it was in there. I was like, wow, okay, God wanted us to sing that song today. And all the other songs, frankly, all of them fit in very well. I'm not sure I could have picked better songs for this sermon. But that song that we sang, Reckless Love, the lyrics of that song go, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, there's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. And this kind of goes back to the psalm where it says, you know, you'll break through iron bars for us. He's pursuing us, coming after us. And this is accurate because he... He pursues us because sometimes we're going in the wrong direction and he needs to redirect us. He shows us we're going in the wrong direction by putting storms in our lives to change the way we're doing things. And we keep on going through this storm and we battle through life in our own determined way and things just seem to go from bad to worse until suddenly there's a situation that happens that creates in us fear. It creates in us this hopelessness where we think, I've got nothing left. And at that point we go down on our knees And we plead with God, please help me. I know I put myself in this situation, but please help me. And since he is there pursuing us, he does help us. And then finally, finally, we begin to understand. But then we go through a process. This is our time in the fish. We go through this process until finally we get to the end of that process and God spits us up back into life. He says, okay, I'm going to ask you again. Will you go in that direction? Just the same way he asked Jonah the second time, would you go to Nineveh now? He finally agreed. Well, this time he's saying, will you go in the right direction now? And we begin to understand. And if we have learned, 
And if we have understood and we've changed the course to reflect what God wants us to do, then he will be with us the whole time. Once we go the right way, he'll be with us the whole time that we go there. Things may not go perfectly because they don't. No one promises they will. But what will happen is that we will be so much better to, equipped to handle things than we were before because God is with us. So instead of floundering around on the bottom of the water with seaweed wrapped around us, God is with us and he will help us. That's why he pursues us. That's what he wants for our lives. So continuing on with Jonah, chapter 3, verse 4, it says, Then Jonah began going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. This was his sermon. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown, destroyed by God. That's not a very uplifting sermon. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. And when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued to Nineveh. And basically he's just saying, everybody has to do the same thing. There's no exceptions. And then later on it says, when God saw what they did and how they turned their ways away from evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. So he backed off the destruction. The 40 days went by, did not destroy Nineveh. Now, Jonah's culture just assumes that God wants to punish the people of Assyria. That's why Jonah wasn't a fan of going in in the first place. He knew he was going to have to go in and preach this message, surrounded by people that were already established, were living in a city that was very aggressive and not very nice. So he was going to go there and preach this message. He was a little afraid of the shoot the messenger syndrome. You come in here and you preach this message, we're all going to be destroyed in 40 days. Well, we'll see who's going to be destroyed. But this wasn't the case. Because often we forget... That God's love, I'm in trouble with this, but God's love for all people is greater than our, our hatred for our worst enemies. He has a much greater capacity to love and forgive than we ever will. So he saw the change in them and he spared them. But this wasn't the end of the story. Jonah got mad about that. He didn't agree that God should have saved them. You think as a preacher, he'd go in there, he'd preach that message, he'd be happy. Because they listened, they changed, and positive results happened. That's kind of what you want in a sermon. So he was successful, but he also wanted to see the destruction of Nineveh. Because it was a nation that was known to be harassing other countries at the time. They were very aggressive to their surrounding countries. They were a real thorn in the side for that particular area. So in the eyes of the Israelites, God would have been doing them a favor. It seemed legitimate that a warlike, an aggressive, and ruthless people should get what's coming to them. God's retribution. But also, maybe, he felt that by sparing them, he kind of made him look like a liar. He told them in 40 days they were going to be destroyed. But they decided to avoid it. They changed drastically. So he personally had a stake in this. There may have been some self-centered viewpoint to this. His credibility was now gone. But the truth is that God cares for every nation. People of every nation. He is, by nature, a savior. Luke 15 reveals in the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son that God's heart is for the redemption of people. All those that come to him have the opportunity to be redeemed. Not just that, but the Great Commission in Matthew 28 says it asks for God's call to take God's message to all the people. Take the good news to all the people, all nations. Romans 1.16 emphasizes the importance of sharing the gospel with Jews and non-Jews, the Gentiles, the Assyrians, the same as, the same as anybody outside of the Jewish uh, religion. Also God's concern about children. We know God's concern about children. 120,000 people in Nineveh. Some of them are going to be children. God mentions his concern for this group. He highlights his love and concern for children across the world. So this is not quite the fire and brimstone God that sometimes we see in the Old Testament. This is a Lord of compassion. And before I close, I want to bring up Matthew 12, 40. So Matthew 12, 40 says, For as Jonah was three days, this is Jesus speaking, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Three days and three nights. He was in the belly of the fish. And Jesus himself is now saying, I'll be three days in the heart of the earth, in the ultimate storm. If we look at a quick comparison of Jesus and Jonah, 
we find that the gospel writer of Mark has deliberately put some language together in one of the stories when Jesus was in a boat and a storm whipped up. And there's a lot of comparison between these two, the Old Testament story of Jonah and this New Testament story of Jesus in the boat. Both Jesus and Jonah were in a boat. Both boats were overtaken by a storm. The descriptions of the storm, if you look at them, are almost identical between the two, between the two writings. Both Jesus and Jonah were asleep. The storm was raging and both Jonah and Jesus were in a deep sleep. In both stories, the sailors wake up Jesus and Jonah and they say, we're going to die. And in both cases, there is a miraculous divine intervention that calms the storm. Further than that, in both stories, when the sailors do wake up, and when, when the, 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 the storm is finally calmed, the people after that are, are more fearful than they were when the storm was going on. Why? Because of the incredible power that they could see that God had. It makes you a fearful believer in God. So these two almost identical stories had one difference. In the middle of the storm, Jonah basically told the people, I'm the issue, get rid of the issue, throw me overboard. And they did. This didn't happen in Mark's story. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus says, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. Something greater than Jonah is here. He's referring to himself. I am the true Jonah. And what he meant by this was, someday I'm going to calm all the storms, quieten all the waves. I'm going to destroy all of destruction. I'm going to break brokenness. I'm going to kill death using eternal life. But how can he do that? He can only do that because he went into the ultimate storm. Jesus was thrown into a storm of eternal justice, a storm that consisted of the sins of everyone that had gone before him, everybody that was there in his current time, and everybody that was coming in the future, us. As Christians, we should burn that into our heart, the picture of Jesus bowing his head, dying on this earth, and heading into the ultimate storm. But it wasn't enough that he endured pain and torture before his crucifixion on earth. He endured torment for three days in the heart of the earth, his words. And if we carry this image with us, we will never say... God doesn't care. We know that he will not abandon us, even in the ultimate storm. So why do we feel like sometimes he's abandoning us in the storms of our own life, which don't compare to the ultimate storm he went through? And someday, of course, he'll return and still all storms for eternity. So we should let that picture penetrate the very core of our being as Christians. Then we will know that he loves us. We will know that he cares and we will have, and he has the power to handle any of the storms that life has to present for us so that we can continue life with poise. God will pursue us even when we end up in a mess, because we do end up in a mess, because we've been heading in our own direction, doing our own thing, struggling through life, fighting against God's direction, because we've been heading that way incorrectly. When we end up with those messes, we call on him and he will help us. When we plead to God, he will help us, even in our guilt, even what seem like impossible circumstances, even when sometimes it's at the last minute, and even when it's not exactly what we hope for, perhaps it's just the first stage of moving on for redemption. So the story of Jonah is a very rich story, and it shows us that God will be there for us all the time. He's not just there when we go to him and ask him to be there for us. He pursues us until we change direction and go the way that he wants us to. It's a powerful story. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for the story of Jonah. We're thankful that you pursue us. We're thankful that you want to redirect us when we're going the wrong direction. We just, we give praise to you that sometimes that's obvious because sometimes we need it to be obvious. Sometimes we miss things. We're not looking for you in our day-to-day activities of life. So open our eyes to see you in everything that happens, to see you through other people, and to see you pursuing us just when we need it. Sometimes you close the door. Help us to recognize that it's you closing it. Lord, we thank you for your word, the powerful scriptures of the prophets, the powerful gospels. We just thank you that we have the opportunity for you to reveal yourself to us through the Holy Spirit and through this word. Otherwise, we would be adrift in a storm, sinking, 
drowning in the seaweed. But you came to us through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day, everyone.